Hi, this is James Jokum, host of Webcomics Reviews and Interviews. Tonight, we're doing world building from the ground up. So sit back, relax, and let the Geek Fest begin. Comic book writers, especially beginners, tend to forget that comic book writing is in and of itself a collaborative process. And not just between you and the artist, but also between you and the audience. An artist, when he sits down and starts drawing, needs details. He needs to know what's going on in the world so he can start designing the costumes or looking at the overall style of the comic. You know, we're talking, if it happens in a city, doing something ultra-simplistic like a kid's comic where you only have like a couple of buildings in the background, all the way up to something as magnificent as the background of Gotham. In short, the artist has to have a very good idea of what's going on in the world in order for him to help you actually put pull off this comic. Flip side, if we're looking at it from the audience perspective, the audience is going to be willing to spend disbelief, but only if there's a reason to. And if you can actually have a, present him with an actual three-dimensional world that is something that has concrete details, well, he's going to be willing, much more willing to suspend disbelief for you. And the more you can get that re reader to suspend disbelief, the better, especially when you start throwing a lot of weirdness to him. I mean, you can do an absurdist comic book if you really want to. But if you don't ground it somewhere in reality, somewhere, that is, there's some sort of actual legitimate logical relationships going on, eventually you will lose that reader. And the fewer details, the fewer things he has to cling on to, the quicker that's going to happen. What this basically means is that you're going to need to have some sort of way to actually have a actual world. I mean, sure, you'd like to basically do nothing more than do character bios, a real quick outline, and then charge ahead off to that, but if you're actually working with any kind of actual artist, well, that artist is going to need to know exactly what kind of sets you're trying to design. Think about that for a second. Just as, you, just as you're import worried about what the actors are doing, what they're saying, your artist is actually worried about what they're interacting with and where they're doing it. You know? There's going to be an entirely difference between doing a... A comic in say medieval Europe versus medieval Japan versus downtown LA. Sure, I can use the same basic characters and the same basic themes and so on and so forth, but I need to have a little bit more than just characters walking across the street. Even if the script just says that, you and the artist have to have some sort of disagreement or sorry, agreement over what kind of actual street they're walking across, you know? And you, as the writer, need to step ahead of time what kind of world this is all going in. Obviously, there will be some artist input, but generally speaking, you're in charge of creating this whole bloody thing. So actually make some actual decisions on what's going on. You know? Otherwise, you're basically going to just simply have this really cool little improv play that's really going to have a really boring background. Everybody's going to be drab, and then you can't figure out why nobody really cares. Well, that's because there's no real details. So, that's something that needs to be considered when you start sitting down. You need to actually go through and design what the actual world looks like. So... You know, consider if I have a comic set in Gotham versus a comic set in Metropolis. You know, Metropolis is bright, shiny. You can bet that even somebody who has a really horrible 9 to 5 job nonetheless has some sort of life they're trying to get to, kids they're trying to raise, and in general they're satisfied with their life, if not downright happy. You know, they get off at 5 o'clock, they're going to race home, grab something to eat, and go out and party. And they're going to be reasonably happy and cheerful. And that's going to have an entirely different feel than, say, if we go over to Gotham, which is, well, cancer on the land. It's dreary. It's depressing. This is a place that creates lunatics just by living there. 
you get off your nine to five job, you're rushing home, you're boarding up the place, and you're there until you have to leave for your job in the morning. You know what I mean? Compare if I put Batman into Metropolis. You know, gothic brooding, kills if he has to. I mean, he tries not to, don't get me wrong, but, you know, you go through a, bat, a fight with Batman, you're going to be needing some intensive care. This is probably not the real greatest, he's probably not going to last long in Metropolis just because he just doesn't fit. Flip side, let's look at what happens when you put Superman over into Gotham. You know, got, he gets a little bit more violent than normal. While at the same time, his cheerful go get him attitude just doesn't gel well with the type of crooks. So, you know, there's... You just simply can't have a character like Superman doing long-term stays in Gotham, just like you can't have Batman in Metropolis. It just doesn't fit. Over time, the characters and the setting are going to create a dissonance that's going to drive your readers net really crazy. You know, Batman without therapy works in Gotham. You flip him over to Metropolis... And straight up, the reader's going to be starting to wonder, why isn't this guy becoming happier? Why is he not checking into some sort of therapy? There's got to be some sort of support group in this place. You know what I mean? The bottom line is, is that details are going to help sell your comic just as much as great writing and great art. More importantly, both of those are dependent on those really good details. Plus, let's look at this if you're going to basically be doing this for a long period of time. You know, you're going to need some sort of actual setting that's actually going to inspire you to actually continue writing, as well as the artist to have a little bit of fun here and there. In short, you're going to need to build some sort of world whether you want to or not. So, let's look at some world building basics. Just in case you're curious, we're not going to go too crazy tonight. We're basically going to define the general setting. And we're going to look at... Well, basically, obviously, we're going to look a little bit more into the importance of why you need to build a world. We're going to look at how these cities are going to be built up. And then we're going to sit back and go after organizations. So, this is going to be all sorts of fun. Honest. All right. Keep in mind, as we're going, when we're trying to set up all these various big settings, you're going to want to keep in mind certain goals. You're going to want a setting that's going to reinforce whatever themes you're setting up for the comic. If you want dark themes, you're going to want something dark. If you want light, a little bit lighter. You see, see how simple this is starting? And I bet everybody's going, oh my gosh, this is going to get horrible. Don't worry. It's not as horrible as you think. It just is going to require a little bit of thinking here and there. Uh, consider classrooms between Hogwarts, a little red schoolhouse, and, you know, inner city L.A. You're looking at three entirely different environments. And each one of them has an entirely different set of themes. Hogwarts tends to be a little bit classist. You know, the whole wizards versus muggles versus mudbloods thing or whatever. But at the same time, it one that's supposed to inspire you off to heroism. And notice how incredibly detailed the Hogwarts thing gets. You know, you've got lecterns. You've got huge desks that multiple students sit at that are incredibly solid. You basically have pews for these huge desks. You've got chalkboards the size of, you know, mountains. You just have some really cool, awe-inspiring stuff that's trying to inspire people off to heroics. You know, and they do a pretty good job of that. Um, Little Red Schoolhouse, on the other hand, is trying to go for something a little bit more simple, a little bit more, I want to say classic, but we're looking more at ultra simple, simplistic here. You know, we're talking a classroom where children from different classes are actually in the same room. So, you know, if you're trying to build a nice, simple, the world is Good has very few actual problems with it, and we're trying to emphasize sort of a frontier feel. 
hey, your little red schoolhouse is going to work really well for you. Inner city LA classroom, ultra chaotic. This is a place where dreams go to die. You know, you have a teacher who has almost no control over the classroom. You've got graffiti everywhere. You know, you've got cheap desks that are probably, I'd like to say an Ikea knockoff, but an Ikea knockoff would be way too expensive for this place. You see how each one of these is starting to get very specific images on your mind? Even with the Red Schoolhouse, you've got a small classroom, simple desk, a basic chalkboard in the one area, and a teacher trying to deal with a lot of different class levels between the various students, you know? Each one of these is an entirely different group and creates its own different feel. The importance of the setting needs to be driven home to a writer because you're the one who's in charge of all doing, in charge of all this. You're basically trying to set some sort of mood to reinforce your themes. And you're going to have to have the artist come along with you, but if you don't have an idea of what you're doing, the artist isn't going to be able to help you. I'll try to leave that off for now, but just keep that, keep in mind that you're the one in charge here. You're the one behind the steering wheel. If you don't know where you're going, it's not really going to help anybody else. You know what I mean? So with that, let's get going. What you're wanting to do is create some sort of universe that's going to have a very organic feel to it. That is, everything is set up as people actually live there, you know? Look at back at the city. You can have an area that's going to have buildings here, houses here. Around those houses, you're going to have convenience stores and supermarkets, as well as various services. When you get to the buildings, well, people are still going to need to eat, so you're going to have little cafes threatened to, all, to go up pretty much everywhere. And you're going to have... You know, you see how I'm building up here? I'm looking at where the buildings are, that is, where people go to work, where the people live, what people are required to live, what makes going to make work a lot easier. And see how I'm setting this up based on just little itty-bitty steps and going, hey, what needs to be here in order for people to work or live here? That's sort of the importance of the organic feeling. Even if you have an ultra-modern city that's set up on a grid system, the same basic logic is going to be applying here. That is, the city planners are going to look at where people work, where they live, so on and so forth. But when we start looking at comic books, we're not necessarily looking at that kind of organic thinking. Because not only are you going to have to look at where people are living and how they're working and all that, but you're also probably going to want to put areas in terms of political mindsets. Think of this sort of on a socioeconomic level. You know, if we were doing a 50s type of movie, you have an area where the rich kids live, you have where the poor kids live, and then you'd have where pretty much everybody else is. You'd have the north side or the south side, for example, or the east side and the, versus the west side. However, the key here is that you'd have people separated in terms of how they think, how they live, that sort of thing. The rich kids are going to be very classist, very snobby. Probably not people you want to invite to a party if you want it to go well. Because they're going to be way too much, I need to be in charge. Poor kids, hey, they're just happy to be alive. And so they're probably not going to worry too much about where you come from as long as you don't put on airs, you know. Other problem is that the stereotype is that there's not all that really, not any crime in the rich side versus lots of crime in the south side. So, yeah, I think I'm going to stick with north side versus south side. But, you know, you start getting the feel for it. If you're going to basically start doing some sort of actual city, 
you're going to notice that people tend to clump based on similar beliefs and backgrounds. So, when you start when you start building your city, what you're going to want to start off with when you start building your cities are you're going to want to try to figure out what kind of mood and theme those kind of cities are trying to represent. Again, look at Gotham versus Metropolis. Second thing you're going to want to do is clump people among relatively similar beliefs and backgrounds. You know, it's basically going to come down to with Gotham, for example, you notice there's a crime alley. There's an actual place in the Gotham City where bad things are known to happen. And from this radiates all the badness. And yeah, you've got your rich areas and you've got your poor areas, but you've also got in actual areas where crime happens. Go figure. Well, when you start dividing your cities, you're going to want to do it exactly the same way. Figure out where the poor areas are, where the rich areas are. Include lots of middle class areas. And you're going to want to clump different types of businesses together if you can. And then, of course, you're going to want to sit back and figure out where everybody lives, where they do business, you know, where the shopping malls are and all that. And yeah, I can hear the freaking out in your, even this far away. Don't. You don't have to do incredibly detailed metropol, uh, cosmopolitan maps. Sorry, I'm trying to avoid using Metropolis because, well, yeah. Anyway, you don't have to design these whole maps. You can get away with doing a generic you know, a really ultra generic type of just setting. Just write down a description of the area and you should be good to go. And you don't have to design each and every little area. You know, you don't have to do like um, a New York where they have a garment district, a Wall Street, you know, Cannery Row, whatever. You don't have to go design each you just want the areas that you're going to be dealing with and have a general idea of where they fit in the geography of the map. Plus, you're going to want to have a general idea of where people go to to get their food, their goods, and even their daily diet and soda. Like I said, it, you, details are important, but don't. But I'm going to step back and say don't go overboard. Do just enough details that you know where your characters are going to be coming from. The reason for this is, well, just you're trying to set up the place, you also want to allow for growth later on. You know, if this is going to be around for any period of time, eventually the art is going to grow. And you want to have generic wasteland that you can actually transform into specific, more specific areas later on. See, that growth is another part of the organic thing. The area will grow as it needs to grow. So you, as the writer, need to allow that, those areas for growth. So don't get... And the really weird part is, the more detailed you are at the beginning, the less room for growth you'll have later on. So, consider that before you get going. You know? Just do the stuff you need, and throw in stuff as you need it later on. That's how almost every city is grown up in America. Or Europe. Or Asia. Or pretty much in, in outer space. You know? So don't worry too much about the details that you don't need. And worry about the ones that you do need. Keep in mind, of course, that as you're growing your city and you're trying to decide on details, try to make sure that each area tends to build into a theme. You know? If you need a sub-theme or a show how a character built up from the beginning and got crushed hey you just build up a little area like the garment district guy got better he designed clothes he got great at designing he got famous for designing a particular style of pants and eventually got hit by a copyright suit you know it's a great reason to bring in the garment district if you need a new area The other way you can you want to design your built your cities on a only what you need at the time situation is that way you can also allow for character growth later on. You know, 
this allows you to eventually, if let's say a character wants to go out and train up for some sort of marathon, well, you go to your city, you figure out an area where they would not only have gyms and that sort of thing, but also racetracks as well as have a general idea of where this person would have to go to get, well, the requisite amount of distance to do a marathon, which is like, what, 26 miles? See, that's the other advantage of having details only if you need them. If you need to design stuff later in, well, if you have every detail designed in from the get-go, you know, you're not going to have a lot of room left for growth later on. You're not going to be able to expand on things. On the other hand, if you leave, just go with the details that you need, you can throw those details in later on. And I don't care if you're trying to do the most sophisticated space station on the planet. You're still going to want to leave huge areas that are pretty much unmapped, at least at the beginning. And then, of course, you can map those areas later on. So don't get too hung up on details, but it's just one of those weird, yeah, you don't want to get hung up on it, but get hung up on it type of deal. Use your own discretion. Do what you feel is necessary. Interestingly enough, this is going to apply once you start designing actual multiple cities. In some worlds, yeah, you're going to have a situation where you're going to want two entirely different cities. Again, you know, DC's Gotham versus Metropolis. You're going to want a lot of areas where the two, two different types of characters can, you know, spread their, spread out a little bit. So when you actually do start designing entirely different cities apply the same basic plot but allow for differences between the two cities because you don't want two cities that are exactly the same you want to have some sort of difference between the two obviously Gotham Metropolis is taking it to an extreme but let's say you wanted something entirely different like you know a small little town that's nice and quiet that you're going to keep coming back to every so often for various reasons, either because it's got some great fishing or some great campgrounds. Hey, you're going to want to design that little town by itself, but you're going to want to apply the same rules as you were playing the cities. That is, you want to know where important stops are, you want to have a general idea how big it is, and you want to leave a little bit of room for growth later on. You're just scaling down from these big, huge cities to these little hamlets. And it can be done. Um, again, just have some fun with it. Figure out the difference between the two cities, between the two towns, or what have you. And just have fun with it. But keep in mind that you don't want to leave too many details in the wind. You actually want to have something concrete that a writer can, or sorry, that an artist can come in and actually design an entire segment of the city and said, hey, we're cool here. Or have a reader come in and say, oh man, this is so cool because he has something he can actually hook on to. You know, I don't care how incredibly crazy your plots get, if you don't have something solid for a reader to hook on to, they're not going to be around that, all, that long. So, you know, have some fun. Put in some really nice concrete details here and there. Let the artist know, and then when the artist has some fun with it, at that point, the reader will have something a little bit more interesting than just simply, you know, genericville. Population 10 million, you know? Who cares? I want a place that actually has a, some sort of society there. And trust me, you're going to love this later on, especially when you start hitting issue you know, 15, or when you start hitting chapter 30, when, when you start putting a lot of pages into this, you're going to love a lot of these really trivial details you put in from the beginning. Especially if you made sense to leave some room for yourself to grow and have a little bit of fun here and there. Something to consider while we're, while we're on this topic is, say, Marvel's New York, which pretty much does exactly the same thing as uh, Mar uh, DC's Gotham versus Metropolis thing because you've got all these different areas in New York proper you know 
it's sort of weird when you actually start looking at the map of New York in terms of superheroes and who's settled where. You've got Daredevil over in Hell's Kitchen. You know, the slums. This is their version of Gotham, basically. You've got Queens, where you've got Spider-Man, which is a nice little middle-class area. And then, of course, you've got downtown Manhattan, where you have the Avengers and Fantastic Four. You notice the difference between the three characters? Between Daredevil and his street-level characters over in Hell's Kitchen. Over in downtown Manhattan, you've got all the really powerful characters that are, you know, go out on universe-shattering episodes every so often. And you've got Queens, which is pretty much, you know, their version of the middle-class area where it's pleasant to go to, but you're trying to go other places. In essence, Marvel is taking New York and actually divided it down into essentially different towns. Because let's get real, there's a different feel between Hell's Kitchen, Queens, and downtown Manhattan. You know what I mean? Just showing you different ways, different takes you can do it. Bottom line is, your first step is going to be designing the, the home base, the city. I don't care if it's a podunk town out in the middle of nowhere... Or, you know, downtown Tokyo. You're going to want to design your cities on some level. And have some fun with it. And everything I've just told you pretty much scales. You're always going to have people divided into various clumps of personalities. Socioeconomic layers. Different philosophies. Um, you're going to want to design where everybody lives. Where they work. Plus the places where they shop. You know, the little... if Even if you have just a little bit of a franchise that shows up every so often, you're doing good. It's just like Starbucks. Starbucks is great, but you can... You have that little concrete detail because Starbucks is pretty much everywhere. Same with McDonald's. You know? If you want to associate really quickly show the difference between two cities and the Starbucks. Weird concept, but you know, think about it. Every city has a Starbucks, but each Starbucks is, believe it or not, somewhat unique in terms of little details. You know? Uh, what kind of coffee grind is there? Uh, what kind of tchotchkes they've got set for sale? You know, even when it comes down to the biscotti, there's a subtle difference between biscotti in New York versus biscotti in San Francisco. Weird concept, but, you know, over time, you're going to find that you're leaving yourself a little bit of room to grow, but combining little country details is going to be a very nice working option for you. And like I said, keep in mind that these don't have to necessarily apply to terrestrial cities as we understand them. The same basic philosophy comes down to uh, how you would do space station. Even if you're having everything in a very small little ship, you know, right off the bat, from the ship's perspective, you're going to have, obviously, you the bridge. Uh, you might have engineering defined pretty well. But uh, over time... You know, you're not going to have everything in the ship mapped out all that well. Um, look at the original Star Trek. And I mean the original series. Not Next Generation or Voyage or anything like that. But all you had was a couple of areas that were reasonably well defined. And you threw in more areas as you needed them. Like, you know, the rec deck. Um, crew quarters, that sort of thing. The same logic you apply to a city, you're going to be applying to a spaceship. Because you're, you're still going to need the same basics. You're going to need to know where people basically sleep. You know, where they live. Crew quarters, in the case of the Enterprise. Where they play? Hey, that's where the holodeck is. Or the rec deck. Where they work? Med bay. Engineering. The bridge. 
you see I'm dividing each one of these areas and having a little bit of fun with it, but I'm still leaving a whole lot of areas left open. Because let's get real, there's going to be a lot more to a spaceship than just the engineering, the crew quarters, you know, so on and so forth. You're going to have huge areas that are going to be you can fill in later. Um, Star Trek Next Generation, for example, is pretty famous for bringing in tin forward. And like, what was it? The second, you know, the, was there from the beginning, but they didn't really get into peopling it out until like the second or third season. So, you know, little details like that. You want to start off with something solid and basically expand from there. And again, building a city and building a starship and building a cute little pocket dimension, the same logic is going to apply. It just gets really weird when you start getting rid of the buildings, is all that happens. And while we're looking at the, or the cities, let's look at organizations. And of course, we'll have to do this really quick. But just wanted to make sure you were thinking in terms of building the actual world world. Organizations are their own little quirky little problem. First off, don't get caught into the trap that you have to design multiple organizations. Sometimes you can design one organization and everything else follows from there. Yeah, I mean, you can either basically go with multiple organizations or multiple factions or some sort of mix between the two. Um, I'm sort of looking at shows like La Femme Nikita here, you know, where you've got the major organization and then you've got the individual spies and somewhere between the two, you've got different groups within that organization. Factions work. I mean, even if you're basically looking at doing it as a superhero thing, you don't have to have a really well-defined villain organization. It all depends on where your theme is going to be taking you. If you're trying to basically go against authority, you're going to want to keep it down to one organization. Because at that point, you've actually got something solid you can rebel. And because you're not bringing in extraneous factors, you don't have to soften, you know, the anti-authority message. If, on the other hand, you did have two different organizations and you're trying to be anti-authority, well, at some point in time, you're going to hit that where... Both organizations have certain elements where they're actually 100% right. It's, at that point, you start hitting the really weird point where you sort of need that authority because you need to assign different uh, traits to two different organizations. And then once you start assigning traits to two different organizations, yeah, it's going to break down your anti-authority message really quick. So if you're going anti-authority... Keep it to one group, and if you need some sort of bad guy group, keep that bad guy group as absolute nebulous as one dimensional as absolutely possible. But instead, you're going to want to do factions within the group itself. On the other hand, if you're trying to do something a little bit more superheroic, well, good guys versus bad guys is always a winning combination. Consider The Walking Dead of all people for a sec here. You originally started off with a relatively strong organization and a nebulous one. The nebulous one in this case happened to be the zombies. You know, ultra, dimension, ultra one dimensional, they were just out there to attack whatever happened across their path. Alright, good. On the other hand, you can set up a really cool authority issue in the in Rick's group and in a lot of ways this is when it ended up happening over time is that Rick decided to well became the Rictator and everybody else had to react off of that so and then of course once you start you know doing the anti-authority thing you obviously had little factions within the group depending on how strongly along the line they were with Rick versus how independent they were Consider Michonne versus Daryl, for example, especially in the later seasons. You know, 
On the other hand, if you want to go a little, the comic ended up getting a little bit more super heroic when you started throwing in, like, the governor and his group, the Negan and his group, so on and so forth. At that point, they actually had somebody who was actually trying to set up something relatively cool. They were just going about it the wrong way. Rick would, his group would pop up and do something about that group usually taking it over temporarily. So, and then of course it was fun to sort of contrast the groups when you had, say, Rick's group versus the Terminus group. So, if when you start setting up the organization, just figure out how many organizations you're going to want to set up and how realistic each one's going to be. You don't have to have every group every organization you're dealing with be ultra well detailed you know just so long as you basically know what the general power structure is who's in charge and a couple of agents you're good to go as far as an organization you know I hate seeing look at X-Files but yeah look at X-Files you only had at any given time you only knew who the head of the FBI was Mulder and Scully, and maybe a couple of other people. And this is an organization that has tens of thousands of people. So don't feel like if you, when you start developing these organizations, you have to go ultra detailed. You know, apply the same logic you did in the cities. Figure out what details you need to know right off the bat. Plan those details out. Leave yourself room to grow. And I don't think there's anything better, uh, better as long as you get that as a takeaway today, we're good to go. That said, when it comes to the organizations, figure out where the theme, basically, as you can have figured this one out, figure out where the organization fits within the theme. Decide if you actually do need more than one organization, or if you need a way with factions, or if you don't need them both, you know, Figure out where you need to, what your organization needs to fulfill within the or, within the structure itself. Um, <laughs> two things you definitely need to think of when it comes to your faction or to your groups are one, what do they give the characters? That is, how much training did they give the characters, and how much of the characters' attitudes and social beliefs are based off of the reaction from the group. This is sort of where La Femme Nikita comes into play. Uh, Nikita got a lot of hardcore training from the group she was allow, uh, allied with, but she also later on didn't like, or very quickly, didn't like how the group was so out to kill people. In fact, a number of conflicts between Nikita and the group, especially that people uh, higher up was that she would occasionally figure out ways to let some of the people she was supposed to kill she was able to figure out ways for them to get away so that that started creating a major conflict you know it's a conflict here characters trying to be nice and honorable organization doesn't really care and eventually that conflict created well was part of the fun seer part of the series. So again, you need to figure out what how much of that attitude the character has is due to the the group they're with, and this can apply positively as well. I mean, if you've got a character who is absolute morose, ultra depressive, was not a happy camper, and all of a sudden joins a great group that person eventually is going to be taking on more positive traits. Uh, look at Batman, for example, when it comes to the Justice League. You know, Batman was not a team player. Batman was ultra-depressed. Batman was not a happy camper. He joins the Justice League, has to deal with people like Wonder Woman, Superman, Aquaman. All of a sudden, okay, he's still not a happy camper. But he is more of a team player. Um, in fact, I think it can be argued that it was because of 
his interactions with the Justice League that he ended up deciding to set up not only the Bat Family, but Batman International. He saw the value of having a group, even if it was loosely aligned. Um, and obviously there were some personality traits he carried over from the group over to Batman. This isn't, of course, to say that there were certain personality traits that went from Batman to the group, but in general, Batman is a much better character, a much more solid He's almost somebody you'd almost want to go out to a party with. Almost. Because of his relationship with the Justice League. So, you need to understand that the... Any time a person interacts with the group, that their personality will shift a little bit. It just depends on what kind of group and what kind of themes you're trying to set up. And, of course... Backing them to the general world building thing, you also need to consider the, what the world in general thinks of that particular group. That is, do they see the group as a murdering bunch of thugs? Do they see it as a savior of humanity? Or somewhere in between? You know, somewhere between a necessary evil or just something that happened to happen. I mean, when you start looking at a lot of real-world organizations, that basically applies. Look at the FBI. Yeah, you've got a lot of people that don't like it because of the authority issues, but at the same time, you sort of got to respect the FBI for getting rid of a lot of major problems. You know, the serial killers, your kidnappers, your terrorists, all of that are all dealt with by the FBI. And so you've got to admit that even if you absolutely hate authority, the FBI actually is doing a necessary job. You know, it's somewhere along the lines of a necessary evil. This is opposed to, say, something like ISIS, where we, on one hand, you can sort of understand where ISIS is coming from. On the other hand, you've got a terrorist organization that has no problem targeting women and children. And, you know, people that have absolutely nothing to do with the thing just to basically, sh just, you know, throw terror into the works. So, you know, they're definitely more on the evil side. I mean, you know, we could go with everybody's favorite go-to, Nazis, but I think that's been overplayed. The basic gist here is that whenever you set up an organization, you need to basically decide on what, how the world at large thinks about it, and obviously that's going to also affect how the mood of those people, characters within that organization are going to see the world as large as well. You know, if the FBI decides to all of a sudden show up at a gun show convention, FBI is probably not going to be, you know, it's probably not going to get a favorable reaction. So, and of course that's going to make the people who are actually the FBI agents themselves be a little bit more paranoid and a little bit more on edge. Which of course could lead to its own conflicts with the people at the gun show in and of itself. So, you know, have a little bit of fun with it. And if you need to make a radical change in the organization, do so. But make sure you make sure it's thorough. That is, you not just get rid of the... You basically have... If you're going to do a major thorough change in your organization, you're going to need entirely new characters. There's just absolutely no way around it. Even if you're just simply rebranding an old character or you're having a psychological shift on that character, you're still going to have, that's still going to be an entirely new character. So, you know, when it comes to your organizations, you need to figure out what the character is getting off of them, how they interact with your theme, and how they interact with the world at large. And then, of course, you're going to need to decide if you're going to need to splinter that group into factions, or if you can actually have multiple organizations working. And like you said, don't be afraid to throw in a second or third organization that's just totally one-dimensional. Even if it's not really an organization. Like I said, Zombies works as an example of an organization because they're there. Even if they are basically not really all that well organized. So in total, the three big thoughts for the week are 
And keep in mind, you're going to find a lot of parallels between setting up your city as well as setting up your organization as well as setting up pretty much anything else. To it, the big takeaways for the week are worry about details, but don't worry about each and every detail. Worry about only the details that you need, basically. Figure out how whatever you're trying to build works into the overall theme of your comic. And I can't stress that one enough because a lot of people tend to forget that one. And above all else, leave room for your a little bit of growth later on. This is sort of why I keep emphasizing don't do every last detail. You know? I don't care if you're designing New York and you've actually got a map you can actually play with or if you're designing a spaceship. Don't map out everything right off the get-go. Leave some very nice nebulous areas for yourself. This will help you grow everything nice and organically. And as you need stuff, you can actually put it on. In other words, you're not stuck to stuff that, oh my gosh, I forgot how am I going to retcon this in. No, you've already left yourself space to add this stuff in later. So basically, just have fun. You know? Deal with the only details you need, allow yourself space to grow, and deal with everything organically if at all possible. And if you do that, you should have some great cities, some great organizations, and you're going to have really great stuff for your artists to snag onto and actually have some fun drawing some stuff. And better yet, by having all these really nice little concrete details, your reader's going to love it, and he's going to be willing to go wherever you want to take him. And that, I think, is the important point to remember here. If you, I mean, obviously there's a lot of other important points, but you're trying to build up some sort of suspension of disbelief, and you can't do that if there's nothing to suspend that disbelief from. So give your reader something to hang that from, and hey, you can do pretty much anything you want within sort of reason. So... Remember that and have a lot of fun when you design your cities and organizations. Have a good evening.